so the fundamental equation at the root of the Buddhist concept of how the world comes into being is a uh, equation called idapachayata, which is when this is, that is. When this arises, that arises. When this isn't, that isn't. When this ceases, that ceases. Which sounds both simple and cryptic at the same time. But what it means is the first set um, of each, when this is, that is, and when this ceases, uh, uh, that ceases. Um, or when this isn't, that isn't, um, is concurrent conditionality. When one thing arises at the same time the next arises. When you stick your hand in a fire, it hurts. Whereas when this comes into being, that comes into being. When this ceases, then that ceases as temporal, meaning that uh, one does something, an action occurs or some event uh, takes place, and then in the future, something happens or something ceases. And what this uh, allows is a complex set of interactions of conditions. The uh, essential insight that issues into the first level of awakening in Buddhism is simply all that is subject to arising is subject to cessation. Namely, things change. So that's the essential truth, is we're surrounded by a vortex of change. But that vortex is changed is governed by this equation. And what happens with those uh, that equation is it creates a chaotic system where uh, different conditions are swirling and changing in a way that is very hard to predict. But it also features the qualities of a chaotic system. And in mathematics, uh, one of those qualities is called scale invariance, which means that whatever manifests on a small level will manifest in a similar pattern on greater and greater scales. If you've seen a Mandelbrot set, that's what it looks like. It's sort of the spiral outwards that looks the same on every uh, different um, perspective. And all this is to say that uh, this is why meditation is so powerful, because you are observing these very simple patterns in your mind, how you control your breath, how you admonish yourself when you wander from your breath, what you go to to distract yourself. And yet, over time, you begin to see that those same small patterns playing out as you sit are exactly the large patterns which have, uh, which have dominated your life. How you control your breath is how you control your friends. Uh, the fantasies you constantly go to when you want to distract yourself are similar uh, to the distractions you give yourself to every day. And so by addressing these patterns at the small scale, you alter them at the large. This is the power of scale invariance. But it goes one step larger, because in the Buddhist cosmos, um, I remember when I ordained, I think the first Iron Man had come out, and we're not allowed to watch movies as monks, but uh, I have seen the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is that what it's called? Just multiply over these last 10 years. I don't, how many movies are there now in this? It's a lot. Um, boundless, boundless. The MCU, okay, good. So it's funny because um, people come to Buddhism and on one level, it's a very practical teaching. Uh, the Buddha taught the handful of leaves, suffering and the end of suffering. And he was very clear that the essence of practice is meditation, and we can all access that. But waiting over in the wings, we have our own, we'll call it the BCU, the Buddhist Cinematic Universe. We have a wild uh, and multicolored cosmology. The thing is, that cosmology is a suspect or a subject to that same scale and variance. So the cosmos in the Buddhist perspective is just a large picture of your mind. At least it can be conceived of in that way. And when we look at the variegated cosmology, you 
can get a lot of insight into your own mind states. It's all played out on a large scale. And the Buddha was clear these things uh, do exist in his opinion, but uh, I think there can be a lot gained just from looking at them as uh, psychological metaphors. So we're gonna get a tour through the ECU. It begins in the hell realms, which is always a unpopular topic, and which is why we never talk about it. But uh, the Buddha in one sutta, um, it's uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya, he compares the different realms to, he says that it's like you have a man thirsty, starving for water. The hell realms are a pit of glowing coals. The animal realm is a cesspit. The ghost realm is a bare tree providing just a modicum of shade. The human realm is a tree with full foliage providing shade. The heaven realms where the angels or the devas live are like a cool mansion. And Nibbana, awakening, is a pool of water. What's so significant there is only Nibbana, only awakening actually gives that wanderer what he needs, a drink of water. Everything else is just respite, or in the case of the hell realms, definitely not respite. But the metaphor is apt. The hell realms are pictured as a place of heat um, where beings are packed together. The most famous hell in the hell realms is the Avicii hell, which is supposed to be a giant glowing box of flame, basically, where beings are stuffed in, I believe the, the commentaries say, as tight as mustard seeds in a jar. And the idea is that beings have almost no interaction with one another. They're curled in on each other, on, on themselves, uh, in their own pain. But I think the metaphor of flame and heat and fire and isolation uh, is exactly the uh, qualities which it's useful to distill out of that image because we've all had uh, times in our lives in the hell realms, um, metaphorically speaking, and what it feels like when there's really that sense of despair, the burning, the heat, uh, the feeling like um, you are completely alone. And that's one of the essential aspects of the hell realms is the strange mix of being completely isolated and yet being completely claustrophobic and a sense of burning. I don't want to linger there too much because I'm hoping not many of us spend that much time there. But I think it is worth noting um, at the end of dependent origination, there's this place where the cycle of suffering ends with a uh, phrase, uh, one encounters uh, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And I think it's very important to see how as we practice, suffering gets lighter. And often it happens so slowly, we don't really, or subtly, we don't notice. But I remember after a few years of meditation, thinking and realizing that those last few words in that phrase, uh, lamentation and despair, no longer applied. Like things still suck sometimes. Things are still difficult. I call practice the slow boil. But there's a type of despair when you really believe you are this body, you are this personality, and you won't live up to the bars you've set for yourself. And that level of despair that's embodied in you know plays like Othello, um, sort of the teeth gnashing, the hellish realms, there will come a point where those have largely disappeared from your mind just because of the practice and this slight stepping back from identification. Ajahn Sunchito calls mindfulness hovering one inch above the ground, just that slight distance. Often when uh, in the images of the hell realms in Buddhist countries, you'll see kind of a, a monk flying over them. So the point is you don't have to get uh, bogged down. The next level is the ghost realm. Um, well, actually, it's the animal realm. 
And we have a strange conceit in our culture that animals are, are very cute. I, uh, and it would be great to be reborn as one. But the animal realm is one filled with fear and uh, drives towards uh, reproduction, food, and a constant sense of having to fend for oneself. Um, and it's very useful to see these realms nearest the human realm often apply to our daily lives. And to see when you're in an animal realm, you know, when you're fixated on, uh, say, a meal or a certain pleasure, or there's that deep sense of fear that kind of is embedded in you. Uh, Ajahn uh, Sumedho often recommends picturing our mind states as different breeds of dog. So, you know, you have your inner Chihuahua, you have your inner Great Dane, you have your inner Rottweiler. I think this is a much more variegated version of doing that. But what animal are you when you step into that realm? And do you really want to remain in that place? And instead of admonishing yourself for that, uh, when those days where you're in that sort of instinctually driven area uh, or realm, can you really spread uh, compassion to oneself? Can you interact with it like you would interact with uh, an animal that you want to care for? Uh, there's pictures of uh, deer would come up to Ajahn Cha and eat out of his hand. This is the natural relationship we have with animals or should have. Is this one of kindness? And can we cultivate that with our own, with ourselves? But it's useful to see when you're in an animal state because we do get into them and we stay in them for quite a while. The next realm up is the ghost realm. And the ghosts, uh, the pretas, are often pictured, uh, the hungry ghosts, many of you will know this image. They're pictured with needle-like mouths and big bellies the size of barrels. They're constantly hungry and they crave. Aspects of the ghost realm, though, are also said to be that it's very similar to the human realm, which is uh, embodied interestingly in that metaphor given at the beginning, in that the human realm is a lush tree and the ghost realm is a strange echo of it. It's a bare tree, shadowed. So the ghost realm is actually somewhat near ours in a psychological sense, but the beings there are obsessive and confused and compulse. Uh, I think compulsion and obsession are the key ingredients. So one is if there is this really fixation. And it's not, say, the necessarily the intense greed of an animal fixation, but it's that rattling obsession over one thing. And other, uh, there's interesting stories of, uh, you know, myths of ghosts. And one of them is of uh, this one ghost, um, I think Ajahn Chah tells this story, um, of basically uh, all the monks uh, were staying in this house and they were all sort of sleeping next to each other, and all their heads were lined up, which meant all their feet were out of, you know, they were different heights, so all their feet were out of order. So the ghost went around and kind of tried to push them so that their feet would be in order, but suddenly their heads were all out of order. And the ghost just went back and forth, sort of shuffling them like this. And I think that's a really important hungry ghost mind state to look at, not just craving, but obsession and trying to get everything perfect in a way you know will never end how there's a certain comfort to existing in a small space of consciousness that is cold and closed and alone because you know it. And this is the mind state of the hungry ghost that pushes the sleepers back and forth and back and forth. Compulsion. How you are supposed to interact with such ghosts is to spread loving kindness and tell them to let go to move on to another state. And I think that's how we interact with ourselves when we're ghosts. Acknowledge the suffering and see if you can brighten your mind enough to let go. We'll skip over the human realm for now and come back to it. We all live in that one. But the next realm up is the, uh, apart from the Bhuma Devas, which are the earthly Devas. And those are a fascinating class of being 
um, which involve a sort of wild uh, group of, there's Nagas, which are basically dragons. There's Garudas, which are big. Uh, they're effectively the in, uh, Native American concept of the Thunderbird. Um, there's tree devas. Um, in Thailand, you're really not supposed to ever pee on a big tree. So there's all these interesting little realms, but I think we can skip past them for the moment. The one interesting point there is how well they correspond to similar classes of spirits across the world. Uh, there's fairy people like the Sith in Celtic mythology. Um, anyways, there's, there's more to go into there, but uh, not for today. The next level up is the devas, the angels. And there's six levels of angel. Um, the Christians would call them choirs, choirs of angel. And deva means radiant one, one who shines. And when the devas come to the humans in the suttas, they always speak in verse, in poetry, which is a beautiful thing to think about. Similarly, every level of deva realm up, time stretches. And I mentioned this saying a few weeks ago that Ajahn Buddha Dasa said that time is the distance between craving and its satis satisfaction. And there's something to that in that the deva realm time, as craving becomes more and more refined, time stretches out. And the Buddha recommended recollection of the angels of devas as a meditation object, specifically relating them to the qualities you have in yourself. And the qualities he said that made a deva a deva, an angel an angel, were five. Generosity, uh, virtue, faith, learning, and discernment. And to recollect the devas, the angels, one says whatever generosity, whatever virtue, whatever learning, whatever discernment, whatever faith those angels have, that is also in me. Which I think is a beautiful way of not getting caught in necessarily uh, realms we don't know about, but to really recollect what it looks like in yourself when there's an angelic quality. And you can see this in people, that radiance, the word deva meaning radiance, you see people who shine, it is visible. I remember watching my grandmother um, as she moved towards death and there was something that happened to her where her skin became almost translucent and there was this shining out. Uh, she was one of the best, most deva-like beings I've ever known. Um, I don't think she ever said one mean thing about anyone. We asked her about Hitler once and she said, I think he was misguided. <laughs> so can you see what those deva-like qualities look like? And I remember in, in Thailand uh, with my teacher, I was like, are these devas real, Ajahn Anand? I would really, I don't know what connections you have, but I'd love to meet one. And Ajahn Anand was like, you meet devas every day. Look at all these people you live with. I was a little disappointed, but, but it's true. You all, we all know what the deva qualities look like. There's a level of sophistication of brightness. And we can learn a lot from the devas. Um, they say the devas are always on time. They're very prompt. And similarly, the uh, levels of desire get more refined. And you see this with um, the act of lovemaking, basically. In the lower deva realms, it still happens. But then as you get higher and higher, they just start holding hands. And then they look into each other's eyes. And I think at the highest, highest two realms, they look at each other's eyes and smile. And then the highest realm, they just look into each other's eyes. And that's, uh, that's how relationships happen in the deva realms. But every aspect of... Uh, sort of sensual desire also becoming similarly refined as you ascend. And also, as I mentioned before, devas smell virtue, it said. So human beings usually smell very bad to them, but virtuous human beings smell very good. So think of that when you're sort of, you know, deciding how to act, I suppose. And the first realm of the devas is the, called the Chatu Maharajika devas. And they're pictured cosmologically, mythologically, on the uh, borders of a mountain, basically. And they're just, they're very, they're the closest to our human rebirth. And one really interesting aspect of these, this level is they die two ways. It's called corruption through desire and corruption through uh, envy. 
And what this means is the Davis supposedly uh, gain nourishment from um, this sort of uh, nectar that uh, is absorbed through their skin. And um, basically, uh, corruption through desire is they get so distracted by the pleasures that they forget to have a meal, and so they just sort of pop and dissolve. And uh, and then the ones that uh, corruption through envy is one deva will see another deva and get jealous of his like or her entourage or carriage or whatever they have in the deva realms, and they'll get envious and then they'll pop in a similar way. They'll get hot, burning, and then dissolve. And they say when devas are about to die, um, their seat gets uh, hot. They start to smell, which never happens to the devas, and they start to sweat. And um, uh, there's a few other signs. Uh, all the flowers that they adorn them start to wither, and the other devas start to take a big step back. But I think what's very interesting here is as we begin to ascend through the deva realms, you can see meditative instruction beginning. So with breath meditation, one real problem is people begin to access a certain level of pleasure through the meditation, and so they forget the breath. They lose the breath and just get lost in the pleasure. And uh, this is compared to sort of leaping off a scaffold into the clouds. You're letting go of the cause for the result, and the meditation will often deteriorate if you do that. And this is corruption by pleasure. You get so distracted by the pleasure that you forget to have the meal. You forget to take in that breath, energy, and nourishment through the skin or whatever you want to call it. And similarly, um, if you know these coarse defilements like anger or uh, envy come up, this is corruption through jealousy. And that can also destroy a meditative state. A level up from these are the Tawatingsa Devas, and the, it's called the Realm of the 33, and they're ruled over by a lord named Saka, which is basically Indra. And it is an exact, almost correspondence to the Greek gods. Um, and these gods are very refined. Um, and they're in constant battle with a being I forgot to mention called the Asuras, which are basically the Titans. So they, the Titans live at the bottom of this gigantic Mount Olympus, Mount Sumeru, Sinaru, it's called in the Pali. And they're angry. Um, uh, their essential quality is uh, rage, and they love to fight. But they think they're in heaven. And this is the interesting thing. They think they're in heaven, except every now and again, they see a gigantic tree bloom at the top of the mountain. And they look up, and they see the devas up there. And they see that actually they're not uh, at the apex of happiness. And uh, the texts, the commentaries say they swarm up the uh, slopes of Mount Sinaru like ants, and they do battle with the uh, Tawating Sadevas. So I told you this is a wild, a wild realm. But what is so interesting there is we humans sit perched very near, and the fact that these two factions battle constantly, I think is a very good picture of how we spend much of our lives in that when we abide in ill will, often it's not an explicit act of rage or anger. Ill will for most of us is a low-level hum. It's just there. And when the Buddha says abide in loving kindness, I think that word abide is interesting because it implies that when we're not abiding in loving kindness, when we're not abiding with the Tawating Sadevas, we abide in ill will. It is our home. And I think we all recognize that kind of low-level hum of anger or ill will that can really form the tone of a life. So for me, I take this as a metaphor for, in part as a metaphor, for the fact that you have to pick a side. You don't get to, if you just let things go, it's almost, it's very hard not to get drawn into the Asura realm and to live your life with that constant hum of anger. So you have to be very clear about raising your mind away from that towards loving kindness, towards bright, radiant qualities of the gods. And what's so interesting also is that the Asuras, they think they're in heaven. And self-righteous anger is 
a uh, heady drug. And I think there's something there about how attractive that is, how you can feel, maybe not like you're in heaven, but certainly like this is justified, this is right, I deserve to be angry, and how dare she. And to recognize that that kind of self-delusion is an asura mindset. In Buddhist thought, acting out of anger is never justified, ever. An action is always more po uh, powerful when taken out of love, even if it's a strong uh, and powerful action. The asuras always lose. Well, actually, apparently they gain the upper hand sometimes, but in the end, I think they lose. There's an interesting story in the suttas where there's one Asura king who gets put into bonds up in the Deva city. And whenever he thinks this realm of the Devas is good, the Asura realm is bad, the bonds loosen and he's free. And as soon as he thinks this realm, the Deva realm is bad, the Asura realm is good, then the bonds tighten again. And I think there's some very interesting metaphor going on there. So, can we cultivate those bright mind states of the devas and that lucidity and virtue? And as we move up from there, we come to, gosh, I don't think we're going to have that much time, but um, we come to uh, the Tusita realm, uh, Pasyama, then to Tusita. And Tusita realm is the realm where all the bodhisattvas are supposedly waiting. It's a realm of loving kindness. And what I think is so interesting there is on the realm of the 33, things are very structured. There's a king, there's these 33 people, there's a whole concept of self and convention. And when you transcend that, you come to a place where things are a lot more open. When you put down a lot of the labels of me, them, my way of thinking, suddenly there's an openness for love, for true metta to manifest, and that's what the Tusita realm symbolizes to me. And I think you can really see this um, with people in your family, is when you're thinking of someone as your mom, your dad, your child, sometimes you're too close to them. The labels and the structures of self are too strong. And there's not actually that much room for love and giving them freedom. And so a really effective means in such cases is to take a step back and think of them as your friend, uh, as your friend in birth, aging, death, in practice, and in awakening. And often that slight step back is what allows a true breath, fresh breath of loving kindness to enter. And for me, this is equivalent to letting go of all those structures in the realm of the 33, all that self and roles, and just coming to a place where it's, it's above that. And that's where loving kindness really is. As you ascend farther, you come to the two highest realms of the sensual heavens. And these are the realms of the beings that, the devas that delight in creating, and the devas that delight in the creation of others. And these realms supposedly are places where whenever one of these devas thinks of something, it manifests. It's like a lucid dream that goes on forever. And uh, as I mentioned before, the irony of this is that in some ways, these devas are at the apex of what the whole of samsara, the whole of the world is scrambling for, which is sensual fulfillment. Whatever they want, it's there. And yet, in this ironic twist, it turns them into basically zombies. They are doomed to a life of supine luxury and nothing else of uselessness. That's the apex. That's where a path of non-practice goes, if not paired with the path. And the one thing I want to mention here is last week someone was saying that when they were approaching concentration, they were seeing a bunch of flashing lights in their uh, vision. And it's a very common experience when you approach unification of mind to suddenly have visions and strange sensations come up. It can seem like the hands get heavy. It can seem like the body expands to fill the room. 
And for me, this is kind of like moving past this strange lucid dream realm where it's almost hallucinogenic. Um, and to know that you just want to keep going because what you come to after that realm are states of true unification and brilliance of awareness. But when you pass through those kaleidoscope uh, images, when concentration gets very subtle and these images come, just consider that you're kind of flying past the top two realms and just keep going. Don't give them too much mind. So we're not going to go into the Brahma realms today, which are the states that correspond to deep concentration. But I think there's a lesson here in really looking at what mind state are you in at this time? Uh, when you're in a hungry ghost state, can you know that you're in the hungry ghost state? And can you take care? Because what the Buddha said, even as a vessel fills drop by drop, even so actions fill up those who do them. So these mental actions of constantly going back to the craving, constantly giving into the obsession, constantly letting yourself indulge in the fantasy of the argument that you've chewed over a thousand times. Know that you're giving yourself to those realms. You are living as a hungry ghost, as an animal, as an asura. And can you really consciously replace that with a brightness, with a deva-like quality, with that? And can you see that in yourself? And take it seriously that these aren't just individual isolated acts. These really determine the world you've lived in because you've walked past people who live in the hell realm. You've walked past people who are in hungry ghosts and you know people who are angels. And to cultivate that in ourselves is uh, a beautiful thing. And finally, I find it uh, helpful to know where in this whole cosmology the human realm is. Because sometimes we want to make this life more than it is. We want it to be perfect. And in some sense, middle-class existence in the U.S. has certain deva-like qualities, and the devas are careless. But in another sense, human existence just isn't that great. We're kind of low on the, on the hierarchy there, and life is very hard. People we love die, they leave, we get sick. And just to have that realistic, there's a certain like settling of the heart when you can say that, like, okay, human life, it's all right. This is what it's like. And not to give up hope in it, obviously, but to realize that looking at it for refuge is a fool's errand. But if we look at it as a chance to learn and grow in Dhamma, then it is a great gift because the Buddha said human existence is the most powerful for practice because we have a decent dose of suffering, enough to make us not careless, and we have faculties to practice. We are in the best spot in samsara in some sense. And once again, you know, this doesn't have to be taken literally at all. This really can be uh, a way of looking at your mind, but to cultivate the deva in you and let go of those below it. So good luck, all of you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Actually, Thor actually takes place in a heaven realm, doesn't it? So there might be correspondence between the MCU and this whole thing. Um, so uh, today, we'll try for breakout groups for a little bit. Um, so if uh, for those on Zoom, we'll break you out into little breakout rooms. For those in person, if you could just uh, turn to people near you. Um, if there's someone near you you don't know or haven't spoken to, then I encourage you to kind of uh, get in a group with them. But if people could get into groups of three or four and just for about 10 minutes discuss the question, which realm do you find yourself being sucked into again and again? And what have you found that can tear you out of it? What skillful means have you found to work with it? And uh, you can all sort of contribute to each other's ideas around that. But let's do that for about 10 minutes and we'll gather again and just share a little afterwards. Go. Okay.
and maybe say your name as well before you speak. Hello, uh, Kurt Courier. Um, my question was, um, how do you uh, let go of problems that arise in practice? Just in meditation or in general? Uh, life and meditation. That's kind of the question. <laughs> I mean, I think um, that's a great question. I, I think a lot of it, uh, you know, the Buddhists spoke about um, different means in the Sabhasava Sutta, which is Majjhima Nikaya 2, of letting go of defilement, basically. And some, he said, can be let go of by seeing. And I think that's one that we have to rely on a lot. Ajahn Chah said that 80% of practice is knowing you should let go of something and not being able to. So just seeing how something hurts again and again until finally you're able to really become disenchanted with it. Um, and that's the application of the Four Noble Truths. It's seeing suffering, comprehending its craving. It's letting go of its cause, craving, and then realizing peace from there and developing the path. But then in the same sutta, he gives a lot of other means for letting go of suffering and uh, some of those, and problems. And um, you know, some of those are avoiding. Um, some of those are uh, annihilating, he says. Uh, for example, with that letting go of a, a thing you know you should let go of, I find sometimes there's a time for what we call aditana or determination, which is where you just say enough. I won't, I just, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to blank and just make the cut and make the determination and make it in front of an image or someone you care about. Um, uh, and there's, uh, you know, other means he talks about is some you move past by enduring, um, some stuff you just have to let blow over, like certain deep aspects of trauma. You can't solve it. It's just with you, and it will soften over time, but making peace with some things we, we do live with. Um, and then otherwise, you know, one of the differences between the Buddhist path and modern Western psychology is the powerful cultivation of positive mind states. Because you know you can see these dark stories that trap us. You know we can see how we're in the ghost realm, the asura realm. But where Buddhism really shines is active cultivation of positive mind states that elevate you past just seeing. Because after a while, just running over those same stories and seeing how they affect us, it can be a lot like walking down um, one of those movie sets of an old western with the cardboard sides of buildings. And they're just cardboard. But you keep feeling them and being like, all right, this is my story. But after a while, you're just propping them up. And there comes a point in Buddhism where samadhi, concentration, sila, morality, it's just like you, you blow it all. You, you, you push them over. And so just having some faith that as the heart brightens, it'll let go of some stuff on its own. So I'll, a, a nice mix of it all, I think. Hi, my name is Mike. Um, <clears throat> my question is, so I assume that the three marks of existence are in all of the realms, right? So even the devas have to, devas have to, have to have that realization before they can move up. Is that correct? To become bodhis, you know, to reach nibbana. Is that? I mean, how does that? Do they even? Do they become reborn? <laughs> So that's, I guess, my question. Great, great question. Yeah, and, and this is a big difference between Buddhist cosmology and Christian cosmology is in Buddhist cosmology, it's all, all realms are impermanent. Um, so the devas too, and the devas say that when a Buddha comes and teaches them, it's said they, they say, oh no, we thought we were permanent, but we are impermanent, and they begin to tremble and become afraid. And uh, the thing is, it's not like this clear mark of ascending, you know, because sometimes, you know, the Deva realms are said to be actually quite hard to realize in because they're so pleasant. And it's similar, like maybe on the surface, your life seems very comfortable and even more appropriate to practice, but maybe it's when things really go bad that practice becomes imperative and that's where the path really happens and maybe that's a gift. So with the Devas, it's the same. It's like, it's not this ascent up. The human realm is exactly where you want to be. Um, uh, 
Uh, but yeah, the Davis are impermanent too, and they don't like it when they figure it out. <laughs> Middle class America is impermanent. <laughs> I think we have a Zoom question. Please. Is that me? Okay. I, yes, go for um, it. <clears throat> in the breakout room, we were talking about anger, and I was going to ask a question about that, and I forgot. Um, after listening to the first question here from the person asking what to do when practice is difficult, and the anger relates to that. For me, um, anger was just a huge, huge, huge issue. I Just tsunamis of anger and rage coming through. And in my very first retreat, I, I, I couldn't really hear much of it because I was so imbued with anger and it was a disappointment. And I went away feeling like a failure. I hadn't experienced rapture. I was struggling to sit on the cushion. I really wanted to kill the cockroach crawling in my sleeping bag, which was bad. But... <laughs> For some reason, Buddhism has always had an appeal to me. So I left the retreat, I went away and came back to Buddhism um, over the decades. And as I mentioned to my breakout partner, um, I recently read a quote from a Buddhist leader. And she said, you know, even if your bum isn't on a cushion, you're still meditating in your own way. And I've used that to give some faith to those difficult times when a meditation practice was just uh, felt like torture, felt like I was wrapping myself in barbed wire. Um, so when practice is difficult, I guess the point of that long ramble is um, obviously you're not alone. Obviously we all go through it, but I don't, I tell myself I might be struggling, but it doesn't invalidate my effort, my intention. Hmm. And over the decades, the anger is just, oh, I'm so grateful it's released its grip or I found a way to quit dancing with it. Um, for me, just, uh, yeah, um, it, it's still something I'm aware of, but as my, um, as Mary pointed out, you have that slight disconnect occasionally that allows you to see the role that anger plays in your relationship to it. So. Again, sorry, I'm babbling. I know we're supposed to be mindful of our time. Just to that person who was struggling, don't give up. You're still on the Dharma. And I don't know about you, if I want to sit and meditate, but my mind just isn't there. I have a little visual toy. It's actually a timer. It's plastic. It looks like a Dharma wheel, actually. And I'll just look at that. And even if that just is what I do for my five, 10 minutes of meditation, it's still far healthier than anything I'd be doing with my mind if I weren't sitting on the cushion. So anyway, sorry, folks, that was a long ramble. Um, so that was me. No, thank you. I, I think that's a great point. Um, I, I, you know, when Buddha's, the Buddha talks about uh, right intention, he talks about renunciation, non-ill will, and non-harming. And so not only does he emphasize the non-harming, non-ill will for two of the three, but it's not like bright, shining metta. It's like, just don't be angry or, you know, work with your anger. And it's such a, it's such, it's much more of a realistic picture of where we're at because we are, we have a lot of anger in us. And I think that's also a useful place of locating ourselves in the cosmology. Like we're, we're half Dave, a half animal. And just seeing, you know, how could we not be angry? We wanted to be happy for so many years and it keeps slipping away. And uh, yeah, so just, it's very common for anger to be like, to come up really strongly for people quite, quite early. And just working with that is a powerful thing. The, the asuras don't give up easily. They keep on swarming up the mountain. So we do have to wrap things up um, uh, actually um, for the time. So uh, we, I hope people can continue this conversation uh, over coffee and so many cinnamon rolls someone cooked um, and other things. So, but before we do that, if we could read the um, blessing braid um, and also one quick question that came onto the YouTube chat uh, before I uh, end is just someone asked how monks remembered the Buddha's words after hearing them only once in the time of the Buddha. 
And I just say that when the mind is imbued with samadhi, like very powerful and lucid, um, it becomes powerful in ways I think are hard for us to sort of comprehend. And people can really internalize stuff very quickly from that place. And, um, you know, if you're in Thailand, you can meet people with powerful jhana and it's, you can almost feel waves of coolness move out from them. But some of them just, uh, the energy it kind of imbues the mind with in its powers is pretty hard to describe. Like I had one friend who was the assistant of one such monk and the monk would pretty much, Longport Shah as well would go for, you know, 20 hours a day off and just receiving guests and doing good. So I think, um, yeah, the people at the time of the Buddha were used to memorizing things and they had a mind in, of a power that I think few of us can think of or conceptualize. <laughs>